Hello, anyone! Before I get started, I just want to make sure that I don't sound like Darth Vader again. I should have fixed it uh, during the intro thing, but... Uh, testing? Nope, yep, I'm good. I don't sound like Darth Vader. Um, wait. Yes. No, okay, I'm still good. Sounded like it bugged out there a second. Alright, uh, so hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Fly Science Guy Star Show's uh, How to Shop for Telescopes. Uh, it's December now, so we all know what that means, that for the past month, we've had our Christmas decorations up. Uh, the second that Halloween ended, uh, I, I would say ideally, uh, I probably, I would have had them up, but I am slow on the uptake this year. Uh, and everyone's, you know, dreading their Zoom conferences with their family members for the, uh, for the Christmas Zoom get-together. But we know here that uh, there is some anxiety with buying telescopes because it's not always super intuitive how to buy telescopes, and uh, we want to we want to make it easier for people. Um, so there are five main things to look for when shopping for telescopes. By the way, as well, it, we're going to talk. Uh, we're going to kind of. Go over what we think are the important details of buying a telescope, but if there's anything at the end of the show that you feel like I didn't talk about or you had questions about, we're going to take questions at the end of the show. Um, you can also ask questions while we're going through the show as well, but if it's like a big question, then I'll just, I'll, I'll just say that I'm going to answer that at the end of the show. But then we're also going to have a dedicated question time after the show's over. Uh, but like I was saying, there are five main things to look for when shopping for telescopes. The first three I'll talk about are specifications that should be in the description of the telescope, and that's aperture size, focal length, and uh, then magnification. Uh, fourth, what you want to know is what kind of telescope it is, a refractor or a reflector, and I'll go over the pros and cons of these two main telescopes. And last but certainly not least, the manufacturer of the telescope is important because quality of a telescope matters. And I'll talk about why quality matters uh, throughout the show. Now the first aspect about shopping for telescopes is the most important thing, I think. And that is the aperture size. Uh, Aperture size refers to the size of the light gathering lens or mirror of the telescope. The larger the aperture you have, the more light it gathers, the better your image looks. If your goal is to gather light and light is your information, then the larger the aperture, the more light that it gathers, the more information you get. So here I have uh, an image of two sizes of, you know, the front hole of the telescope, what gathers that light uh, and we can see that the 40 millimeter aperture is uh, here's a picture of the moon both taken on the same night uh, and we can see that the 40 millimeter aperture is not as it doesn't show as fine of details on the moon as the 70 millimeter aperture now there are also differences between these two telescopes uh, leading to why the 40 millimeter looks so bad but uh, aperture size plays a big part in it and we can see just the the stark difference between these two you can see the details around the crater way better on the 70 millimeter so bigger diameter of the aperture uh more light more information better your image this is similar to uh televisions as well uh you might have a television or if you've gone shopping for a television that you might see 1080p or 4k these numbers are referring to pixels. So like 1920 by 1080, that means there are 1920 pixels across and 1080 pixels down. And pixels are like little squares essentially that flash different colors. And those colors flashing together give the appearance of an image. The more pixels that your television has, the more information that can be displayed at once, the better the images will be. Uh, that's the same thing for telescopes. So again, if you have a larger aperture, you get more light, and that light is detail of the object. So if you can gather more light, you can see more of its detail. 
Now, the second thing is focal length. Focal length is the distance between the aperture that gathers the light. So, in for instance, here, the lens of the telescope that gathers the light, this is the telescope's aperture, uh, and the distance to where that light focuses, or the focal point. And this distance between the two is the focal length. Uh, now, what's important to know about focal length is how it compares to the aperture that gathered this light. And telescope companies usually put this forward as focal ratio. So, just as I said before, uh, focal ratio is the ratio between the focal length of the diameter, or I'm sorry, the focal length of the telescope, and the diameter, or how wide across the telescope lens is. So focal length over diameter. That's not really too important. Uh, the equation's not really that important, so don't get scared. We're not going to get too hung up on that. Uh, but this focal ratio uh, is what you shop for depending on what you want your telescope to do. So uh, telescope companies, they advertise their uh, focal ratios. Whenever you shop for telescopes, you'll see something like F equals little f over some number, let's say 10. So this number right here is what you're shopping for in terms of focal ratio. So focal, ratio, uh, focal ratios that are 10 or higher have a tighter field of view. So this is good if you want to, say, look at Mars, for instance. You would want a telescope with a bigger focal ratio. But telescopes that have focal ratios of f over little f of 7 or lower have a wider field of view. So this is good if you want to, say, look at star fields. So say you want to look at the entire Orion constellation, you would want a telescope with a, uh, a, with a smaller focal ratio. Now that does leave a lot of space in between because, you know, there are numbers in between 10 and 7. So focal ratios that are 10, 9, 8, and 7, uh, these are telescopes that are good at both of these. So if you're shopping for your first telescope, I recommend looking for a focal ratio that's either f over 10, f over 9, f over 8, or f over 7. These are good for pretty much whatever you want to do, looking at planets or looking at star fields. Also, focal ratios uh, 7 and smaller are good at astrophotography, if you're into that, because you get that wider field of view uh, in case you know want to see nebulae, star fields, or just get a wider view of whatever you're looking at. Um, now, the third aspect about shopping for telescopes is magnification. Now, uh, a lot of times, whenever off-brand companies try to sell telescopes, they really like putting out magnification at the forefront because it's really easy to make it look impressive. So telescopes that you might see on a box that says 60 times magnification or 120 times magnification, the uh, companies, the off-brand telescope companies that make these, they're like, those are big numbers. And their hope is that people will look at these numbers and say, I know those numbers, those are big numbers. But magnification requires a big enough aperture to make use of it. Uh, so first of all, before I continue, uh, it's important to know that magnification, when they sell, when off-brand telescopes sell try to make their selling point magnification, they're not selling the telescopes. They're more selling their eyepieces because magnification only really, like you get your magnification by the focal length of the telescope and the focal length of your eyepieces. And I'll talk about that towards the end of the show. <clears throat> but uh, when, you're, when you see telescope companies try to sell you telescope by magnification, they're not selling you a telescope they're trying to sell you the eyepieces 
uh, that come with the telescope. So I want to go back to the analogy of pictures, because like I said, it, even with the best, like even with a really high magnification, it requires a good enough aperture, a good enough image to make use of that. Going back to TV, uh, TV sets or computer monitors, if you have an image that is 1920 by 1080, uh, we consider that high definition. But if you magnify it, increase the size of the image, you can only increase it so much before it becomes blurry. Because then you're starting to see those pixels that we talk about kind of inflated. Uh, if you increase a 1920 by 1080 picture by about 10 times, it might start to look blurry. If you take that same picture that is at a resolution of nearly 50 times the 1080 picture, and you increase it that same amount, the 7K picture is going to look sharper at that same magnification than the 1080 picture because it has higher resolution, it has more data. We can see in the 7K picture, you get a better, you can see like the bottom of the uh, chimney where it connects to the roof. You can see that the chimney in the 7K picture is less blurry than the chimney here. Uh, this little vent right here, it has more detail and you can see it connected to the roof than you better than you can in this picture. And the tiles individually, they look more individual than they do here. They just kind of look blurred and smudged on the 1080 picture. That's because the 7K picture, though it's the same image, is higher resolution, it has more data, so it doesn't look as bad when you magnify it. So if you don't have the resolution to make use of that magnification, then it's useless. If you have a small aperture size that's not gathering a lot of information, and you magnify that in a single area, you have even less data in that single area. So for instance, I took this picture of Jupiter with one of the smaller telescopes that I have, a 70 millimeter telescope. It's the, I took it, it's the same telescope that I took this picture of the moon with, which looks pretty crisp. Now the moon appears much bigger to us in our sky than Jupiter does. So I took a picture of Jupiter with that same 70 millimeter telescope, and you can maybe, if you look really close, just barely make out a band of clouds on Jupiter right here, a darker band. So you, someone might see this image in a telescope and say, I want to see Jupiter even bigger, right? I want a better view of Jupiter. Well, if you magnify this image of Jupiter, it doesn't get any better. If you start out with something that's not, that doesn't have a whole lot of detail to it and you blow it up, it's going to have even less, it's going to appear to have even less detail. Now that, that band of clouds is even harder to notice in this blown up image. So this is why uh, the other things that we talked about, aperture size and focal ratio, rank higher in importance than magnification. You need a large aperture and an ideal focal ratio to make the uh, view less blurry before magnification does any good. Now don't get me wrong, if your scope does have a fantastic aperture size and focal ratio, then magnification will allow you to see those crisp images even bigger, which is awesome. But if a co telescope company is advertising magnification above all else, it's likely they're doing so because the aperture and focal ratio aren't as ideal. Now. The next thing to start shopping for with telescopes is the type of telescopes. And there are two main types of telescopes. Uh, there are reflectors and there are refractors. Uh, now the difference between these two telescopes, reflectors and refractors, differ in how they gather light. My I messed up. Okay, sorry. How they gather light. So refracting telescopes work by having two lenses. One in the front of the telescope and one in the back of the telescope. 
So light will come in to the objective mirror at the front. This is what we would consider, you know, this is what we can talk about when we talk about aperture size for a refracting telescope, the size of your objective lens. So light comes to the objective lens. The objective lens bends that light down in the telescope to make the light focus at a point. Then that light continues on through the telescope to the eyepiece and then continues through the eyepiece into your eye. Whereas reflecting telescopes, instead of working via lenses, they work via mirrors. So light comes into a reflecting telescope and it goes down the entire tube of the telescope before it reaches the objective mirror. This is the aperture of the reflecting telescopes, a mirror in the back of the telescope and its size. Light comes into the telescope, reaches the objective mirror, bounces off the objective mirror to what we call the secondary mirror, bounces off the secondary mirror, and the light focuses to a point right here. This is the focal point of a reflecting telescope, continues on to the eyepiece, and then, of course, leaves the eyepiece into your eye. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to these different ways of uh, gathering light by these two different telescopes. Uh, refracting telescopes, earlier I talked about how uh, light comes in through the objective lens, through the telescope, and out the back uh, objective lens. Now that's not false, but that's also not the whole story. Uh, a disadvantage to a telescope using lenses is that refracting telescopes suffer from something called chromatic aberration. Now, chromatic aberration is uh, when you have the light coming through a lens. Uh, if, you, if you're a fan of Pink Floyd or you've ever even seen like uh, pictures of Isaac Newton holding a, a glass prism that breaks up the light. That's what happens with these lenses. So white light, from whatever you're looking at, hits the lens, and when that light bends, uh, different colors of light bend differently. So red light bends the least amount of, uh, the least amount out of all the other visible light colors, and blue light bends the most out of the different visible light colors. So you have uh, what you end up with is the broken up light with red on the upper part, uh, white or yellow light toward the middle, or yellow light toward the middle, and blue light toward the bottom. And so what that looks like through your telescope is if you're looking at a star, when that light comes through, you'll notice that there are red and blue uh, halos around the image. So... This happens in refractor telescopes, but this doesn't happen in reflector telescopes. And that's because all uh, different light, different colors of light bend differently, but all colors of light reflect the same. So since you don't have a lens breaking up the light initially when it comes in, you just have mirrors, uh, all the white light comes into the telescope, all the white light reflects off the back of the telescope. All the white light reflects off the secondary mirror. Now, the eyepiece it does have a lens. Eyepieces do have lenses on them. Uh, but the distance from the lens to your eyeball does not give enough time for that light to really be broken up. So you still won't notice a lot of chromatic aberration. Um, now, I showed you that image of what it looks like uh, for a refracting telescope here, but um, I did take some images with a refracting telescope compared to a reflecting teles telescope. And uh, the differences can be, uh, is you, you definitely notice the problems. So this is an image that I took with a reflecting telescope of a speed limit sign 
And this is the image that I took with a refractor of that same image sign. We can see that the chromatic aberration is extremely noticeable. You can see the red halos and the blue halos around these numbers. Now that might look horrific, uh, but this isn't necessarily representative of all refracting telescopes. And I'll tell you why. Because this telescope is made of lower quality parts than what a name brand telescope might be. So this is a, this was taken with a telescope that was, it's an off brand. Uh, we got it from Walmart and it has a plastic lens on the front of it rather than a glass lens. And you never, never want a telescope that has a plastic lens. Now on the same day, the same speed limit sign, I took another picture of it with another refractor that was a Celestron refractor, a name brand telescope, and it has a glass lens, and we can see that it is far better than this refractor. Again, this refractor has a plastic lens, this refractor has a glass lens. And uh, the light going through different media, like glass or plastic, can bend more so or less so. But in this case, plastic refracts that light more than glass. Um, so yeah, the, the, the image of this, this one, this was taken with a Vivitar uh, refractor telescope, plastic lens, off-brand, and this was taken with a Celestron on-brand glass lens. Now, I know that a lot of people my age and maybe even, uh, old, well, definitely uh, older than my age, but maybe even a little younger than me, they might remember having parents that either grew up during the Great Depression or... Uh, had parents whose parents grew up in the Great Depression and got some of their, you know, tendencies of shopping from them. And, you know, it's not bad to shop for a good deal. But telescopes are not like chicken nuggets, right? You can't, you can't buy a bad telescope and smother it in ketchup and expect it to taste better. You, uh, the, the term you get what you pay for really comes through with telescopes but that doesn't mean that you have to break the bank um going back to the image that i showed you earlier this one right so that image that i took of the street sign that's the same telescope i took this image of the moon with uh now this walmart vivitar off-brand telescope was 30 dollars right about $30, maybe $50. This 70 millimeter, almost twice the size of this one, much crisper image, it was a reflecting telescope. This telescope was $60. Ten, uh, somewhere between 10 or $30 more than this telescope and you get a much better quality even though it is name brand. So you don't, I don't want to make you cringe by saying to only shop on brand with telescopes because it is very true. When you shop on brand for telescopes, you're purchasing from a company who made their name off of making quality telescopes. They have the money, they have the engineering, and they have the drive to make sure that the telescope that you buy meets the standard that they uphold. Whereas off-brand telescope companies, the fact that they're making them with plastic lenses means that they're just trying to make a quick buck. They don't, they, they probably don't have the money, they don't have the engineering, and they clearly don't have the drive to make a good refracting telescope. So if you're buying a refracting telescope, buy on brand because you will get a better product with a on-brand refracting telescope. 
Now, before I go into some more of the downsides, I do also want to mention that uh, the, another difference between refractors and reflectors are that it's cheaper to make a reflector than it is to make a refractor. Um, I guess I'll get into that in a second because this kind of play this kind of plays off of the next downside of refractors in that they are limited by the size of their aperture. Bigger lenses tend to also be thicker so as to keep them from being too fragile. This makes them heavier, this makes them more expensive to make, and it can make it less functional because of the expense that it takes to make it. Uh, so going back to the heavier thing, uh, te uh, refractor telescopes operate uh, strictly by having a lens in the front of the telescope and a lens in the back of the telescope. So if you want a bigger aperture, you know, it becomes heavier and it's weighed down at the front of the telescope. And what that means is it, became, it can become unstable. So as you get a bigger lens, it becomes top heavy, it can tip over, it's harder to keep it on the target if you don't have a good enough stand for it. Now, if you buy a big aperture refracting telescope, it's probably going to come with a stand that can handle it. Uh, <laughs> I say that, but also the Walmart telescope that I got that had an itty bitty little aperture also had a, uh, a telescope stand that couldn't even hold its 40 millimeter aperture. Uh, oh god, how much is 40 millimeters? That's like less than two inches, right? Like 40 millimeters is less than two inches, I think. Um, so imagine a stand not being able to hold a two inch lens, right? So that's that's another thing about the bad thing about shopping uh, off, off, off brand telescopes. Uh, secondly, it's more expensive to make a larger lens because it's more likely to have imperfections, which would make the telescope less functional. So as you get, as you make the mirror bigger, uh, it can get, you know, uh, oh, what are these called? It can crystallize inside of the lens as you're making it. It can form bubbles inside the lens that can alter the path of the photons, as we can see, and it will just make your image look poorer. Now, again, with on-brand telescopes, um, with on-brand telescope companies, they have the money and the drive to make sure that their lens is as perfect as possible. But off-brand telescope companies will not take the time to make sure that the image that you get is still a good image. Now, the reason that it's cheaper to make reflecting telescopes is because of how reflecting telescopes operate. You know, again, it has mirrors instead of lenses. And it's a lot easier to make a perfect mirror than it is to make a perfect lens. Because for mirrors, you don't need the entire inside of the mirror to be perfect. You only need the reflective side to be uh, perfectly reflective. And if you get the reflectivity wrong or the albedo wrong of the mirror then you you know keep buffing or you buff it in a way that lowers the reflectivity i don't think they would ever do that because more reflectivity is better um but they just keep buffing it until they get it right so it's a lot they don't have to start all over again if they don't get it right um also the mirror is a lot lighter so you don't have to have like more expensive stands necessarily to hold it. You still want bigger stands if you have a bigger telescope, uh, but it is lighter than lenses. Um, and so it's easier to make it bigger because again, you don't have to worry about imperfection. So it's a lot cheaper to make a reflecting telescope than it is to make a refracting telescope. Now, uh, another downside between, I know, I know we seem like we hate 
refractors. It's just, this is the nature of it. You know, we start... People like um, Hans Lipperhey. He was one of the, I think he was the first person to make a telescope with lenses. And that was the first kind of telescope with lenses. But then Isaac Newton came along and he made his Newtonian reflector telescopes. And so, you know, they turned out to be better and they solved problems from the refractors that they had. And this is just what happens. You know, technology moves forward and we get better things. So to us at Fly Science Guy Star Shows, we do think reflectors are better and more worth the money because, again, they're even cheaper to make, so they tend to be cheaper than equally sized refractors. Um, for instance, the... Uh, let's see here. My images. So I took a picture of a moon with a 70 millimeter refractor. That's this image here. And I took... This is the same image that you saw earlier of the moon taken with a 70 millimeter reflector. Uh, both of these are the same diameter telescope, same same size aperture. Only this is a refractor. This is a reflector. Um, and the reflector, again, like I said earlier, was about sixty dollars, right? But this equally sized refractor is about one hundred twenty dollars. Um, now, there are other things to it, like the focal lengths or the focal ratios are different. This focal ratio is about 10 in the refractor. The focal ratio for the reflector is about 3. So we see I couldn't get the whole moon in the refractor telescope because it had a higher focal ratio. And in fact, this isn't even, this is actually more than actually fit in the telescope. In reality, the refractor telescope is so tight because it has a high focal ratio, which is good in some instances, I'm just saying, um, that it's more like half of this fit in the refractor telescope. Uh, and I had to stack the images to get the full moon. Uh, but this image of the moon with the reflector had a uh, focal ratio of like three. So you were able to get, I was able to get the entire moon inside of the reflector so that's that's not that's not a point about quality that's just you know an example of what i was talking about earlier in terms of focal ratios giving you a tighter view or a wider field of view but the reflector is about half the price of the refractor of the same size so uh in, in my opinion you get a better image um for a cheaper price and i don't think i don't see many downsides with that um, so a lot of large telescopes that people use for research are usually reflector telescopes. And in fact, more often than not, they are a brand of reflector telescopes called Cassegrain. And I'll talk about the advantages of that in a second. But most of the time, research grade telescopes for visible light are reflectors, but there are other types of telescopes that look at different types of light besides visible light. Um, and so these are not mirrors or lenses. These are satellite dishes. And they look for radio wave, uh, radio wave light. They look for microwave light. They look for gamma ray uh, light. These are radio dishes rather than mirrors and lenses. Um, and those are those those tend to be uh, even bigger. I don't know if I don't know how cheap it is to make a uh, satellite telescope. I've, I actually didn't look into that because I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to recommend anyone go out and buy a radio telescope as their first telescope because that's not, you know, what they want to use it for. Um, but so observatories, they use either big reflecting telescopes or they use satellite dishes. Um, Ah, Sorry. I don't know why I keep forgetting you're back there. I live here. Um, while we're on that topic, what is the kind of telescope? What? What is the kind of telescope that you were saying um, is used for reason? Has a focal length that's so long it has to go through uh, a different room. Yeah, that's so that so cool. that is a reflecting telescope as well. But it's called I think it's called a Kude or a Kade. Um. It's just a reflecting telescope with a longer focal length, which uh, is what I'm going to talk about uh, next, which uh, actually, Lori, 
Fun fact, it might not be out of your budget to have a satellite telescope because you can turn any satellite into a telescope. Uh, so just, uh, I mean, it would be a small aperture size, but go over to your neighbors, steal their satellite dish, rig it up, and there's a, there's a, there's a uh, radio telescope for you. Or microwave. I, it depends on what it's made to capture. I don't, I don't know what rays that satellites use. Um, but what was I, what was I saying? Oh, focal length. So another downside about, uh, yeah, I was actually thinking about when we do these shows, just putting her on the computer behind me so she can just chime in when she needs to. Um, no, you cannot make a telescope out of cable. Uh, but, all right, back on track. Limited practical focal length for refractors. So refractors, if you want a longer focal length to give you a uh, bigger focal ratio, then you would need to make your telescope longer because light will come in through, you know, the objective lens straight through to the back. Now, there are times where you could use mirrors in a refractor, uh, but you're still going to end up not only with a long telescope, but now with some weird periscope-like telescope um, in terms of refractors. So if you want a longer, or if you want a longer focal length in a refractor, you need a longer telescope. And this can be troublesome because it can be harder to control the telescope and make your images harder to stay focused on. And this effect you can try for yourself uh, when you're, whenever you're walking around and you see a stick, a really long stick, hold the stick at one end and uh, move your hand back and forth just slightly. And notice how much more the end of the stick further out from you is moving than is your hand. Uh, this happens the same thing with telescopes. So if you have a really long telescope, any slight movement in your eyepiece is greater movement at the end of the telescope where it's trying to gather that light. So it can be harder to stay focused on an image um, with a really, really long refractor, especially when your field of view is so tight because the focal length is so long. However, reflecting telescopes, since they only use uh, mirrors to reflect the light around, you can get a longer focal length because the light comes in, after it bounces off the mirror, it travels all the way through the telescope, and it also then bounces up into the eyepiece. So you add the distance between the secondary scope and the focal ratio, or the focal point, and the, you add that to the distance of the secondary mirror from the objective mirror. Um, and you get a longer focal ratio in a smaller package. Now, uh, earlier I talked about Cassegrain telescopes. They are another type of reflector. It uses mirrors. Uh, this kind of brand, like this, this idea of the eyepiece being towards the front of the telescope, this is called a Newtonian reflecting telescope, um, but Cassegrain telescopes, instead of the eyepiece coming out the side up here near the secondary mirror, uh, you still have a secondary mirror, but the light goes from the objective lens all the way up to the secondary mirror, and then the secondary mirror bounces the light back to a hole that goes through the uh, objective mirror since it's blocking, like, the secondary mirror being in the middle of the telescope, we can actually see the struts for it right here. Uh, it's already blocking a little bit of light, not enough to be noticeable when you're looking at things, but uh, it bounces the light back down toward the objective lens again, and then through it. So essentially, you get double the focal length than is the telescope long. So you can have a much bigger focal length in a smaller package for reflecting telescopes. Uh, so that makes them a little less cumbersome and that uh, makes them, you know, easier to stow away because they're not as, uh, as long at any rate. And so those are, those are the main uh, things, you know, uh, 
aperture size you want you know uh well i guess first what i recommend is starting out with a budget for a telescope right make your budget a little flexible because you never know what you're going to find but set a budget for a telescope then the first thing that you want to shop for is your focal uh or your uh aperture size so the bigger the lens or mirror the better uh then focal ratio and then worry about magnification again magnification when you shop on brand magnification isn't really something that they advertise because magnification is the relationship between the telescope and the eyepiece which again i'll get into in just a second but um you could buy a telescope without an eyepiece, you wouldn't be able to see anything, but you can buy your own separate eyepieces for the telescope. And you're, you'll see eyepieces that say like 20 millimeter or 10 millimeter. The bigger the number of the eyepiece, the wider the view, um, or the less magnification you have, the greater or the smaller the eyepiece, like maybe 7 millimeter or 4 millimeter, the more magnified your image becomes now again even the best type of telescopes have a limited magnification so just shop uh for magnification based on your um based on the aperture size that you get now when you buy a telescope it will mo most certainly come with an eyepiece uh maybe even two uh so you can kind of play around and see if the smaller eyepiece that they give you gives you too much of a view, uh, too too much magnification or not, and then just shop for eyepieces on on the side after you've bought it. Um, so aperture size, focal length or budget, then aperture size, then focal ratio, um, and we always we always really recommend reflecting telescopes because they do tend to be cheaper than equally sized refracting telescopes you don't get chromatic aberration with reflectors and uh the, the image just all around looks better um and then of course only shop on brand for your first telescope um really just especially just stay away from uh off-brand refractors anyway now there might be you know i don't want to throw every single off-brand telescope company under the bus you know, like, there might be companies out there that are genuinely trying their best to compete against uh, uh, Celestron and Mead to make quality telescopes. But you're, it's, it's like trying to find a diamond amongst a whole bunch of coal, right? Like, it's buried under all the coal. You're gonna, you're gonna get your hands really dirty before you reach that one good company. Um... So I just recommend for your first telescope, get a Celestron, get a Mead, maybe an Orion, but, you know, make sure you shop on brand first. With that said, even if you shop on brand, do not shop at Walmart. Now, I did some price comparisons just to see what Walmart was selling when I was doing some research for the show. And what I found is that Walmart does sell name brand telescopes, but they are obnoxiously priced. So here we have a refracting telescope with a 90 millimeter aperture. That's what this number means here. 90, uh, 90 millimeter aperture. Another thing about Walmart is they never, as far as I've found, they never post the specifications for their telescopes. So, especially if you shop off-brand, they the off-brands won't tell you what their aperture size is. Even the Walmart telescope we got that was off-brand, the telescope itself didn't even tell me what size the lens was. I had to take it apart and measure the aperture myself. I don't really recommend that, uh, but you should only be shopping for... Uh, with companies that give you this information up front. Walmart doesn't do that. The off-brand company Vivitar never does that, even with the information that comes with the telescope. So don't, don't shop off-brand and don't shop off Walmart. And this is why. Walmart doesn't tell you any information about the telescope. It's just the naming convention that Celestron has. I'm able to tell that this is a 90 millimeter aperture. 
and they're selling it for $391.66, okay? Almost $400. I went to the manufacturer's site. I went to Celestron's website and looked for this same exact telescope. They are selling it for almost $130 cheaper. It's $260 on Celestron's website. It is almost $400 on Walmart's website. They don't give you anything extra. It's just another $130 because they bet on people not doing their research on telescopes. Uh, here's a, another telescope. This is a reflecting telescope. They typically, again, are cheaper than refracting telescopes, but this one has a 130 millimeter aperture. This is a fairly large aperture. Um, uh, we we have a 130 millimeter reflector as well, um, and they're selling it for about five hundred thirty-seven dollars eighty-five cents. On I looked on Celestron's site, they're selling it for a little more or almost two hundred forty dollars cheaper, two hundred forty dollars less, and to kick it all off. When I was looking for this telescope on Celestron's site, this is the more expensive version of it because this is the motor-driven one. That means that the stand that comes with it has is computerized. You can have it take you to star systems or you can have it take you to individual stars, individual planets. You have to align it first and that takes some practice, but this is like an automated telescope. And it's still 200, almost $240 cheaper than what Walmart is selling for it. And again, Walmart doesn't give you anything. I don't even think it comes with the motorized mount because they aren't advertising that. But don't shop at Walmart. They, they're, they are going to gouge you. Um... And more to the point, they're probably overselling the crappy telescopes too. So even if you did, for some god-awful reason after watching the show, buy an off-brand telescope, don't buy it from Walmart. Um, I looked on Target. Target is better with that. I didn't notice Target seldom went that far over what the manufacturers were selling it for. And that was only because they sold a cell phone mount with it. Um, at least you got something more when you did it at Target. But I still recommend buying your telescopes from uh, from the website or going through the website because here they're not actually selling this telescope on the website. They just list their different realtors uh, that, uh, that sell them. So if you can't get the telescope you want from Celestron, shop around and definitely don't buy from Walmart. Here's another telescope, right? $1,020.95. Um, it's okay. If, it's okay if Walmart comes for me because I have better telescopes than they sell and I'll see them coming from a mile away. Anyway, so full brass telescope, $1,021 essentially, right? On Celestron's site? Yeah, it's about $1,000 there too. It's a fully brass telescope. I don't know what you want. But... You know, if you want a full brass telescope, it's not really that impressive, right? It's an 80 millimeter aperture. Uh, so it's smaller than the 90 millimeter aperture that is uh, about one fourth the price of it. Um, the, the only reason it's, it's, it's this much and it's here is because it is a full brass telescope with a real wood frame. Uh, you don't need a full brass telescope. If you want it, uh, buy it from Celestro and you get it for 20 bucks cheaper. So it's it's never worth it shopping at Walmart for your telescope. Go to the manufacturer's website, see how much they're saying the scope is worth, and then shop around uh, based on it. Um, get start with Celeste, Celeste, start with Celestron, start with Mead. Uh, if there's nothing there that you like, you can maybe go to Orion. Um, Orion's not as big, but they are a more well, uh, well-named brand in telescopes. Um, 
And yeah, I hope I hope this knowledge arms you guys, uh, whomever whomever decides to watch this, with uh, confidence in uh, buying telescopes. So again, just to summarize, set a budget for yourself. Shop for aperture size first, then decide what focal ratio you want uh, based on what you want to use it for. Again, uh, 70 and lower is a wider field view. Uh, 10 and higher is tighter field view. I recommend, pardon me, for your first telescope, start out with a focal ratio of 7, 8, 9, or 10 because this range, 7 to 10, is an all-purpose telescope. It's good for looking at planets or it's good at looking at star fields. Um, it kind of gives you a middle, middle ground in terms of your uh, field of view. And uh, never shop at Walmart. Don't, don't shop for your telescopes at Walmart because they will gouge you. Um, now, before I go, there is one thing um, that I want to talk about. And that is that uh, a lot of times whenever uh, I talk about telescopes with people, uh, sometimes if they have a telescope, they'll say that they don't feel like they're using their telescope right. Um, one comment that I got when we were advertising this video is that they said that it worked when they were testing it during the daytime, but didn't te work when testing it at night. And I, what I assume by that is that they just don't have their, they just, uh, aren't successfully focusing it right. So something that's really important is focusing your telescope. So... Uh, earlier I talked about, you know, the eyepiece of the telescope and the uh, lens of the telescope working together to give you a good image. So, um, the eyepiece has a focal point just like the objective lens has a focal point. And to get the clearest image, you need the focal point of the eyepiece to rest directly on top of the focal point of the uh, of the telescope. And we can see down here by this image, it's simulating how it might look as you get closer and further away from the two focal points meeting. So you want them to be right on top of each other to give you the clearest image of whatever you're looking at. And any telescope that uh, can be focused has a focuser right next to the eyepiece. Um, and so it'll be a knob that you turn either counterclockwise to move the focal point inward or uh, clockwise to move the focal point outward. Um, and you just play around with that for a little while uh, until you get it right. It can be hard, especially on cloudy days, to get it just perfectly because uh, if you have a lot of moisture in the air, your image still might look blurry, but it's just like playing around with it to see what the clearest point that you can get your telescope to that night. So it's important to just, you know, keep practicing getting the focal, uh, you know, adjusting your telescope and uh, you doing it enough to get used to how your telescope uh, works in this way. So practice makes perfect in this regard. But that's all. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed the show. Um, if you liked what you saw and you want to see more, you can. we have our past streams on our Facebook page and on our website, flyscienceguystarshows.com. If you like what we do and want to see, uh, see us keep doing it, uh, you can help us out by donating to us uh, on our website. It's completely safe through PayPal. Um, you just go to the site, find the donate button on the top right, and uh, it'll take you to the PayPal page where you can safely donate from there. Um, but with that said, I hope you guys come back, learn more, never stop asking questions about space science and the world around you because there's so much that we don't yet know and so much that we can all still learn together. But with that said, I'll open the floor to any questions that anyone will uh, could have. Uh, but if you're all set to go, have a wonderful rest of your evening and uh, happy holidays.
the graphic? Oh, you mean the quick guide? Yeah. Um, we did also post a quick guide on our Facebook page as well. Um, it's just a really, it's, you know, it's a summary of basically of the show, the, the do's and don'ts and what we recommend. Uh, it's really small and it's on the Facebook page. So you can, uh, go to facebook.com forward slash fly period science period guy period star period shows. And, uh, and you can refresh your memory there. Um, when I talk about... Uh, uh, Becca, Becca wants me to talk about the images on refracting telescopes being upside down compared to reflecting telescopes that are not upside down. And that has to do with, uh, damn it, Brandon, no! Only if you get ketchup. You need a lot of ketchup to make their to make their products good. Don't no, don't buy don't buy off brand, don't buy ketchup for your telescope. Um so refractors are upside down because of how the light comes in. So we have if you if I were standing here and this was the light coming from my head, and this was the light coming from my feet, as it goes down the telescope, the upper part flips down to the bottom and the lower part flips up to the top and so normally you're looking at the telescope you know standing straight up and down uh and so my head will appear down here and my feet will appear up here in the telescope but reflecting telescopes uh though they do bounce the light around in a similar way so this is my this is the image of uh Let's say instead, because the light doesn't come up here, this is kind of like a top-down view rather than the refractor being a side view, right? So this would be like the left side of my face. This would be the right side of my face. And so it comes down the tube, bounces up, bounces there. So now the right side of my face is on the left side and the left side of my face is on the right side. So it doesn't flip the image upside down more than it kind of uh, flips it on the vertical. Um, so it doesn't appear like it's upside down, but it still does flip the image in a way. So if you're looking at Jupiter through a, uh, or let's say, let's say, oh, this is, this is a good example. So these are, here, here's the moon, right? So this is the reflecting telescope. This is the refractor telescope. And we can see that what's normally the crater that's down here is now up on top. Um, and I believe this was a, a waning moon phase, which means that it is flipped on the vertical, right? So it's flipped this way but it still looks upright uh, rather than this, which is flipped upside down noticeably. So at least reflectors don't flip your images upside down, but they can flip it this way. But there's also some telescopes that sell corrective lenses to counteract this. And uh, so it's, it's really not a huge deal, but that is a thing about it. Um, but honestly, it's not really a deal breaker either way. It's, you know, up to preference. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Or look for, for example, like ballast mirror or something specific at a specific on a planet. It might not be exactly where you think it if it's flipped and to have that in mind. So, um,. In terms of, like, the... You notice that the magnification was different, and that's because the focal ratios are different. Like I said earlier in the show, um, your... Uh, the focal ratio, the higher the focal ratio number is, the tighter the view that you have. The lower it is, the wider view uh, field of view you have. So this was taken with the Celestron Refractor, 
that has a focal ratio of 10. So it's not really magnified, but it is a tighter field of view. Whereas this is uh, the reflecting telescope, and it has a focal ratio of about three and a half or four. So it's a wider field of view. So refractor tighter, be not because it's a refractor, but because of its focal ratio being 10 and the reflector being a uh, wider view, not because it's a reflector, but because its focal ratio is three and a half or four. Um, so this is, this is the stark difference between a high focal ratio and a low focal ratio. Um, there's not really, uh, like a picture quality, uh, difference necessarily between these. Um, but it is, you know, it is, it is what someone should keep in mind if they want wider field views of the sky rather than tighter field views. Also, another thing is uh, longer focal range uh, lengths give something called angular separation. So uh, it's not that this is really zoomed in, but you have better angular separation of the smaller details on the speed limit sign than you do on the uh, than you do with the reflector. You can still see the diamonds, and if I were to uh, zoom in on this image, you'd be able to see the diamonds even better, but because the refractor has a higher focal length, it has a better focal, or it has a better angular separation, and it also has a tighter field of view. So these are just things to keep in mind when uh, it's, this is like, this is what comes down to personal preference. No matter who you are, the larger the objective lens is always better, but it comes down to personal preference or the focal length because it depends on what you want the telescope to do um so like i said i still recommend focal ratios of seven eight nine ten uh those four just because they're good for all purposes last you want to talk um she, so, Becca, Becca wanted me to talk about why I don't recommend Cassegrains for your tourist telescope. I do not not recommend it. Um, personally, Cassegrains are a favorite of mine. I like, I love them. They're better for astrophotography because they're, uh, you know, smaller because I talked about how um, with... Schmidt, uh, with t uh, Cassegrain uh, reflecting telescopes, instead of just being a small addition to it by shooting it off to the side, you get double the focal length for whatever you, for whatever size the telescope is, um, but in a much smaller package. So I can get, like, if I were to just take into account this red line here, I could get the same amount of focal length in a telescope that's half the size of this, if it's a Cassegrain telescope. Um, so I love Cassegrain telescopes, but they require more engineering, so they're much more expensive to make, so they're more expensive to buy. So maybe in that regard, if you have a low budget, you probably won't be looking for large aperture Cassegrains. But if you have a lot of money, and you find a Cassegrain with an objective size that you like and money isn't an option, I always recommend going with Cassegrains. Cassegrains are great. Also, Cassegrains have a glass uh, a glass pane on the front of the telescope uh, so um, debris doesn't fall down into the open telescope that you see in a reflector. There's nothing here stopping stuff from falling down into the tube. So it can be harder to clean reflectors, but Cassegrains don't have that problem because they have a glass pane here also protecting the interior. So I love Cassegrains. I think Cassegrains are the best uh, in terms of domestically owned telescopes. The price range is much. It is. What, what is the size of this one? So she pulled up a... Oh, yeah. She pulled up a Cassegrain that's... Oh, well, this is a huge aperture, though. Like... Let's let's look at um, ninety millimeter Cassegrain. 
Yeah, but I feel like if I'm going to shell out... Right, that's fine. I'm just, like, screen, saying... I, I just, like, I want something closer screen. to what we're talking about, right? Like, look at that. The, a 90mm a 90 Schmidt, uh, Schmidt Tassigrain, 500 bucks. You know? They, they are more expensive. And I would recommend, you know, shelling out for more. If you're going to get a reflector, get something bigger, like... Um, let's see here. What I showed earlier in the market research... Uh... The, this is a Newtonian reflector, again. So what if we found a 130 millimeter Cassegrain? Uh, let's see here. They do not sell 130 millimeter Cassegrain. Uh, how about a 127 millimeter Cassegrain? Ah, there we go. 127 millimeters, so that telescope is $300. This one, 550. Also Celestron. Um, it is more expensive. If you have the extra 250 and I don't know. It's it's really up to personal preference because you know, I'm just I'm just a Cassegrain fanboy. Um, but you know, if you could go for a bigger Newtonian or a smaller Cassegrain, go for the bigger Newtonian, honestly. Like the the aperture size is more important than the engineering of the telescope. In terms of like Cassegrain to Newtonian telescope, uh, still shop on brand, but I love Cassegrains. I didn't talk about them much, so I I probably shouldn't talk too much about them now because it's confusing because I didn't really talk about them. But um, just go with a big Newtonian; they're cheaper. But all right, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Um, look forward to in the next uh couple in, in the next couple weeks we're going to be doing another uh roadmap to the stars where i talk about you know history of astronomy again talk about constellations talk about uh astronomy's connections to christmas uh or well the holidays in general not just christmas and we're, we're going to try to make it as secular as possible uh not just because it's the right thing to do but because you know you get a wider perspective that way you know know more about the world around you rather than what's in your own bubble and all that jazz but with that said i hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your night and a wonderful holiday season <laughs>